feel like you're just going through the motions in life? This podcast is for you. A while back, I felt just like you. It wasn't until I heard that whisper in the wind. Nadine, learn to podcast. Now I'm on a journey of discovery, interviewing others who have also leaped into the unknown. I'm Nadine O, creator of the Over 50 You Are Not Done Yet show, a podcast about personal awakenings, spiritual connections, and stories of joy. Shall we begin? I love live. You know, I love, you know, I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know who's going to come around, you know. I don't know what people are going to say, and that's wonderful. That, that gets me more excited. That's percussionist Karen L. Smith. I met up with her in her home in Philly. We decided to set up a few chairs for our interview in the lower level of her home. I couldn't wait to hear about her journey to where she is today. Deep down inside, seeing a black female drummer making it totally rocks. Karen Smith. And elevators don't take that long, so you don't have that much time. Um, I feel like I embrace percussion, so that's kind of like in my blood, so I would say. I'm Karen Smith, I'm a percussionist, who also writes plays and directs and um, produces a number of opportunities for other artists to have their work shown. And I'm a humanitarian and uh, spiritually centered. Hmm. And then the elevator's at the next one. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Time to get off. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been a musician, creator, spirit, teacher uh, all your life? I think so. You know, I think that life gives you a chance to find all the things that you are about, like you, you were gifted with. And I think at this point in my life, I think all those things were definitely there from the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like... Um, uh, a room full of blocks, and you don't know what to do with them until you start touching them and, you know, seeing how it can work, and, and all of a sudden you build this great whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think that's, that. yes, all that is me. And um, I'm that room full of blocks, and, and, and there's been there for me. <laughs> What's your favorite part about performing? My favorite part about performing, I do so many different kind of performances, um, and I play with all, I play just about all styles of music. So I think it's always something different, not just playing um, all blues mm-hmm. every time, but the way I play all blues with this group and the way this person might sing it this time, because you have a vocalist, or you know, we we might take it like make it reggae or, you know, mm-hmm. just, um, I think it's just the unpredictability of what can happen in, in live, doing live. Mm-hmm. Even with record, recording sometimes, you have done recordings, but live, I think, it's just being unpredictable, like what can happen. For you, it's live. It's live. It's just mm-hmm. being live to be on the street. I love performing on the street. That's mm-hmm. one of my favorite things mm-hmm. to do. That's gotten a lot of jobs that I do right now because I perform on the street, that visibility. Mm-hmm. People have hired me for uh, different events, and they still hire me. So I think that live, I love live, you know. I love, you know, I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know who's going to come around, you know. I don't know what people are going to say, and that's wonderful. That, that gets me more excited mm-hmm. to do what I do. I, I don't pay attention to it either. I don't, that's not my focus. I just love performing live. There are a number of things you do for the community. The one that stands out for me, and um, I often see it on Instagram, (laughs) (laughs) it's you working with kids, and it's almost like they're at the playground or something. They're playing the drums, Mm -hmm. and and, and it's boys, it's girls. It just looks so beautiful. Yeah, it's it's supposed to be fun. I think, though, I like that you said the playground, because that's my presentation on it. It's free. 
-hmm. You know, I'll put the instruments in the middle of the floor, you know, okay, grab what you want. Mm -hmm. And they'll grab, you know, gravitate to what they think they want, and then they'll change it again, mm -hmm. you know. And then they'll find that they have their favorite instrument. But it is like a playground, you know, it's free. You know, I want you to find the rhythm within yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to make you play like this. Mm -hmm. I want you to play what you hear, what you feel inside, mm -hmm. and see how we can all come together with it. More information on Karen L. Smith can be found in our show notes and on our website at over50youarenotdoneyet.com. Now, don't you go anywhere. My interview with Karen L. Smith continues. When did your passion for music and expression begin? Because it's I, I think it goes beyond the music. I think that um, when I realized what I, the ability of, of, of finding beats, probably started real early, like at seven or eight, because we listened to a lot of music at home. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother played a lot of music, especially gospel music. Mm -hmm. But she loved all kinds of music, and we listened to, grew up listening to Motown, the Motown sound. Mm -hmm. So I always, you know, kind of found that those beats on a drummer, I was always attracted to the drumming. And, and would play on top the countertops or uh, paint cans or whatever, just tapping out. Mm -hmm. So I think that early, but I think by 10, I kind of realized this is something that's more than just um, countertop kind of thing. I, I, think, I think I can do this. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Even in school, I, I would try to play. You know? I didn't play the band, but I would play sometimes. My mother saw that I did love the drums and I wanted the drums because my cousin, her, her mom bought her a drum set that mm -hmm. she never really played, but she expressed, I guess, one Christmas she wanted it, and she got it. So I did the same thing. I said, I want, I wanted the drums. And she said, no, drums are boys' instrument. You know, you'll learn to play the piano. And mm -hmm. she got my father to buy a piano. Mm -hmm. And so I took piano lessons that I really didn't like, but I learned music theory from that. Mm -hmm. And I did that for like three years mm -hmm. before she dropped it because I just wasn't showing interest and it was costing money. Mm -hmm. So I would say drums still stayed there. I would bang on the piano. Um, I bang on cars. The cars, all we had these cars, they just had this great sound. You know, they were really yeah. solid. And, you know, I would, we outside with friends and we'd make up songs and one of them would dance. And, you know, that's how we entertained ourselves mm -hmm. in the summertime. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I said I never gave up the idea that I'm going to play drums one day. Mm -hmm. Um, it took till I was 19 to get my first drum. And what kind of drum was that? It was a kunga. Looking at your array of drums right now. <laughs> well, they are right there. Look at them. Um, Hanging out. I guess it's not fair to say which is your favorite. What is your go-to drum? I think my go-to drum, though my kunga was the first drum in my life, djembe. Um, it's one of my favorite drums to play. Mm -hmm. I love that African drum. I think it really touches, besides other people, it touches my soul. And mm -hmm. I think it, it takes me this kind of, I would say trance almost, like I'm channeling mm -hmm. the ancestors. Someone else is, if there's such a word, mm -hmm. are playing within me, you know, because I hear the rhythm in the beginning when I first started. Mm -hmm. But the fire comes in and, you know, mm -hmm. that village takes over, so. But the djembe is my favorite. How'd you break the stereotype of female drummers? And, and is it still a <laughs> continuous uh, challenge? I think you, I'm always breaking. <laughs> I think we're always doing it. I don't think it's really been broken. Like, oh, yeah, now we're, you know, I, I get a lot of work um, because I'm, people see me. Mm -hmm. I think if, I, if they didn't see me, uh, you know, uh, do what I do, I don't think I would get work by just somebody telling me, oh, you know, there's an African drummer over here. You know, but the visual part, like, the, they'll, male or female, they know that you do it. Mm -hmm. But once they see you, that's mm -hmm. when they want you. That's what Sonia Sanchez had told me. She said, visibility, then revenue. The more visible I was with what I do, you know, it started changing. So my visibility, when they see me play, that makes it different. Mm -hmm than just for me to tell all my drummer. I've gotten more work from people seeing me than just giving out my card. Yeah. So I say that stereotype or that barrier is still, it 
world still exists per se, but it's coming down more and more because there are more women out there drumming, you know, in all shapes and sizes and, and all the different type of drums that we have. What percussionists will have drums and travel immediately to your events? Karen L. Smith will make your request at have drums will travel immediately at gmail.com. Shall we continue? What is it about creating a drum circle and bringing other people in? I think it does it by itself, you know, the rhythms. I, I've played by myself, in fact, I've tested it. I played by myself in the park, and one by one somebody joined me, whether they came with a drum or a guitar, or they just wanted to stand around and dance or clap or, you know, have a tambourine, whatever. But I've, I've seen the community come out, you know, the drumming really is, like kind of brings a village in. It is the communicator, it is that, you know, oh, something's going on, we need to be there, you know. Always oh, a gathering happening, I hear the drum. You know, it's like an instinct. Some people are, might be afraid of it, but most people, you know, kind of gather for it. I think that's the powerful part about a drum circle. It does it by itself. It doesn't need any help. Whether it's one drummer, several drummers, it doesn't need any help. That, that, that heartbeat comes through, you know, you just, gravitate towards it, especially children. Children are so innocent, so they they drag their parents over mm-hmm. immediately. You know, they look in for the carrots, they, they run over, you know, they want to dance or rock or, or play, you know, mm-hmm. they just want to be a part of it. But I try to do my part in, in going out to, to different schools, even sending out proposals mm-hmm. that some of my jobs have come through, you know, to come and, and perform and, or share, do it a workshop or do an assembly so they can see and become a part of it. Always audience participation is a must. You know, it can be for adults too, but audience Mm -hmm. participation. The playwriting came very early because I loved Plays. I love all kinds of plays. My sister was instrumental in that. She took me to a lot of stuff at an early age. And I love plays. I love live theater. I still love live theater to this day. And um, I was a very shy child. I'm the youngest of eight, and that was a, another form of expression. I would create these characters. I would go by myself. I play by myself, and I would they, create these characters. You know, these little short stories at first. Mm-hmm. And then I would write more, and, mm-hmm. and um, I would get some of my friends to come over, and we would act out these characters. You know, everybody would create something. You know, mm-hmm. like, this is the storyline, and then we did we record whatever we were doing. You know, on the reel to reel was out at that time, and um, at least the audio and just play. That was part of playing. Mm-hmm. Playwriting was part of playing. More information on Karen L. Smith can be found in our show notes and on our website at over50youarenotdoneyet.com. Now, don't you go anywhere. My interview with Karen L. Smith continues. So I wrote this play with the, from the idea of the two uh, founders, which is Stephen and, and Kali. Uh, they give me the idea, and I built from that idea. That's mm-hmm. where Legacy originally came from. Um, it's about if these four lead, great leaders came back and, and to, to this world to this day and, and help this young male that was going astray. He wouldn't listen to his parents. He's ready to drop out of school. He knows what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. He's 16 or 17. He knows it all. And here they visit, like, like almost like a Christmas carol. He's, they visit, they come to visit at night to this mm-hmm. kid in his bedroom. And, um, and he doesn't believe it. And then they give them all, he give, they give them all the history within that time. So by the time he wakes up, he's filled with all this knowledge. So he has to, because each one teach one, he has to go spread it now. Mm-hmm. You know, that's his job. Mm-hmm. So um, it was Frederick Douglass, Marcus Garvey, uh, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X. They came to visit him. And they were all played by young men, young children. Ever have a moment where you said to yourself, it's too late to change careers? I worked so hard to get to where I am. Don't go anywhere. Karen's story just might have you beating a different drum. When I 
I first quit my nine to five and, mm -hmm. you know, I want to be an artist, I want to do this full time. But I didn't have a plan, I just wanted to do it. I didn't mm -hmm. know what that was going to entail. I said, well, I need to move, remove the nine to five so I have room to do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And then there was nothing. There was nothing. <laughs> there was nothing going on, though. There was no money coming in. You know, mm -hmm. I, my savings was dwindling, and I couldn't get a part-time job because I had already asked the universe to make this opportunity happen. Mm -hmm. So it cleared the space, and things that I was qualified for, or or even like dummy down my resume to take anything. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't allow it to happen because mm -hmm. I asked for to be a full-time artist, and so that's really what I had to focus on. I had to. Start using my writing skills to create proposals for myself. Don't look in the papers for my or online for my job. Create that job, you know, mm -hmm. create it. And so that's what I did. I started sending out to schools, libraries, museums, mm -hmm. you know, networking, 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 networking. Mm -hmm. And that's how it eventually started changing. Not right away, but eventually started changing. Mm -hmm. Patience, you had to have patience. And now I do it full time. What was it that pulled you toward saying, I'm, I, I'm going to take that leap? Was it something that happened or, or did you just wake up and, and say, today I'm quitting my job and I'm going to you know, do this full time? And how old were you when it happened? <laughs> right? It wasn't that long ago. Um, the year before, we, we just started doing 3D this 3, mm -hmm. um, getting it out and around. And by that spring of 2013, it was going to go and do a little run here in Philadelphia. Something about that spring, or that March, came in and I was like, wow, I really can't go back to this job anymore. I'm depressed. I don't like it. I'm, I'm 53 years old coming up and I don't want to keep doing something I don't want to do. And this is what I love to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, I've tried it before and stepped out on faith and, and I ran when it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. At the time, I, I just ran. I'm like, I went and got a job. And I kept running, you know. This time I'm not gonna run. No matter what, I'm not gonna run. I'm not gonna run. I'm gonna have to go down. If it has to go down a little bit or whatever, I just gotta keep my mental state up mm -hmm. because it wasn't doing any better in a, in a nine to five. My mental state was completely off. I wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. I was going through the motions because I was getting a regular check. And I stepped out on faith. I, I gave them a month notice, and by March 7th, I said goodbye of 2013. Um, it was rough, and it, I mean, really rough, where, you know, uh, I could have gotten evicted from my apartment. There was no food in the cupboards, and I used the share program that was nearby, and, you know, whatever um, anyone helped me with as far as financial. I said, well, maybe I need to, to give up my apartment and live. Get roommates. That way, take some of my uh, pressure off my, my living situation. And I did that in 2014, late 2015, somewhere in there. I got the rhythm. I found the rhythm. Things started clicking. The other programs were calling me, asking me to do stuff. The visibility on the street of, of playing with my with the group that I put together, we used the people. All the stuff that I was doing just started clicking. By 2016, it's, it really just. You know, it just kept going up. Sonia Sanchez said visibility and revenue. I worked with her throughout that time, and she had said she had said that to me. In the beginning, I was like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. But I told her recently, in fact, I was like, you know, I say that every day, visibility and revenue. You know, because she said in the beginning, she said I was just writing, I was writing poetry, but I wasn't getting paid for it. It was a teaching job. She said it made things change for her when she got came to Temple. All dreams are possible, you know. And timing will make, you know, it's everything for it. Mm -hmm. This is my time, so, you know, when I thought it was my time, it wasn't my time. But I needed to do everything I, I needed to do to get to my time. I did, one thing I didn't need to do was give up. And there were times, especially in 2013, I was ready to call quits. But not call quits as far as go back to another job, say goodbye to life, because I, I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I felt punished by that, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. is it because I'm a female, is it because I'm black, you know, what is it, you know, is it because I'm gay, what, what is it that I'm mm -hmm. not getting it, you know, because I'm poor, I, mean, I, I deserve it, mm -hmm. and I had all this self-doubt pushing against me, mm -hmm. and it made the year 
darker and darker mm -hmm. until I was asked to play for a Kwanzaa event. This minister that was there who gave his, his um, view on this principle. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what he said verbatim, but that woke me up. And I ran with it. I grabbed it and I ran with it. I grabbed him and I ran with it. I needed that energy. It wasn't my drum. Nothing was working. Mm -hmm. you know. But whatever he said that day, Clarence I, Hayes, I still thank him. Because I'm still, I'm still here, and I'm doing what I need to do. But timing is everything. Keep dreaming, but timing is everything. How young are you? I'm very do young. you think about that? <laughs> I only think about that when it's time for my birthday. Oh, 2019, I'll be 59. This is, I'm getting ready to leave my 50s. Wow. But until that happens, you know, I just think about this today. This is what I need to do, and this is my goal for for today. I feel like like I've heard a hunter, you know, it's never too late mm -hmm. to start whatever, you know, it's never too late to um, to have a mission, to find your, your dream, your purpose, you know. Um, I really would like to be able to internationally be recognized and do more, um, whether it's playing a gig or doing a workshop. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. That's my ultimate goal. Tell me something. What's your story? What's your song? That's what all this is about, finding it and singing it. I hope this episode inspires you to leap into the unknown and never give up on your dreams. My name is Nadine O, and you've been listening to the Over 50 You Are Not Done Yet show. Until the next time. Mm -hmm.